Our next speaker is Neil Giridharan from the University of California, Berkeley, who will be discussing no commit proofs, defeating live lock in BFT. Neil? Hello, uh, my name is Neil Giridharan, and I'm a second year PhD student at UC Berkeley, advised by Natasha Crooks. And today I'm gonna to be talking about BFT and specifically on how we achieve minimal latency, linear authenticator complexity, and optimistic responsiveness, and partially synchronous BFT protocols using a construct we call no commit proofs. So there's a lot to get to, but I promise I'll do my best to keep you awake for the next 15 minutes. Um, this is joint work with Heidi Howard, Itai Abraham, Natasha Crooks, and Aline Tomiski. So let's talk, let's talk about the talk. So our work has two main contributions, the no commit proofs and a new BFT consensus protocol called Wendy, which is enabled by these no commit proofs. And in this talk, we're gonna focus only on the no commit proof construction, but more details about Wendy can be found in the full paper. So the setting I'll be focus, focusing on is the same as a bunch of the popular leader-based BFT protocols, such as PBFT and HASA. Namely, we assume that there are three F plus one replicas, a partially synchronous network with the worst case network delay parameter called Delta and standard cryptographic assumptions, which are used for uh, digital signatures. So there are three magic properties that previous partially synchronous BFT protocols failed to accomplish simultaneously that we're gonna try to uh, get here. Uh, the first is latency. So latency is generally undervalued when compared to throughput, but is just as important. Namely, it's been shown by companies like Amazon and Google that an extra 100 milliseconds of latency can actually cost millions of dollars. And additionally, for applications like a transactional database, which cannot have big batches, uh, higher latency can actually increase transaction contention, leading to a higher abort rate and thus lower throughput. And so minimal latency for our setting is going to be two rounds of communication between the leader and the other replicas. The next magic property uh, we're going to strive for is linear authenticator complexity. And by authenticator complexity, we mean the number of signatures or max that are received as part of the protocol. And so BFT protocols are notorious for having uh, quadratic or even cubic authenticator complexity, making them um, extremely expensive in practice. And so for newer blockchains that are run with uh, hundreds of replicas, uh, this makes linearity especially important, especially for scaling to larger values of F. And finally, we have optimistic responsiveness, which is a property that commit latency should depend only on the actual network delays rather than byte delta, which is uh, the worst case uh, delay uh, parameter. And so this is especially important for like wide area settings where higher tail latency forces system designers to pick higher values of delta. And so um, this is especially important property in that setting. So now I'm gonna go briefly on how most of these uh, partially synchronous BFT protocols work. So at first we sort of have a prepare phase which guards against equivocation. And so namely the prepare phase ensures that a Byzantine leader cannot get multiple values committed in the same slot. And then next we have sort of this commit phase which persists a committed value so that future leaders remember uh, earlier decisions. And so this sort of feeds into the view change uh, so when there's a lack of progress, an old leader is replaced with a new leader, and this new leader must preserve any committed decisions from um, earlier leaders. This sort of uh, feeds back, and so um, back to the prepare phase, which you know repeats the cycle all over again. So we're really going to focus on the view change block, since that's really the source of complexity for all these protocols. You know, the view change is notorious uh, because it must preserve all these earlier committed decisions by old leaders. And furthermore, the view change is sort of the differentiating factor between which of the magic properties we're actually able to achieve. So let's start with how you know, other BFT view changes work. So for PBFT and SPFT style view change, each replica sends a quorum certificate, also known as a QC, to the new leader. And a QC indicates that a proposal could have been committed in a particular view. And it contains an authenticator that indicates a quorum of replicas voted for a particular proposal. And so in this example, you can see we have three different QCs for uh, values U, V, and W for views one, two, and three respectively. So now upon a new leader receiving a QC from a quorum of replicas, it sends all the QCs that received in the view change to all the other replicas. And so having to send all these QCs sort of ties the hand of the leader as it cannot hide you know, any QC that was committed by a particular replica. However, the problem here is that this view change fails to make linearity since the leader has to send a linear number of authenticators to a linear number of replicas. So next up, we're gonna talk about the Tendermint and Casper view change. And as before, each replica sends the QC that it has um, to the new leader. However, this time, instead of the new leader just waiting for a quorum of messages from the replicas, 
it wastes this additional delta in order to ensure that it receives QCs from all the honest replicas. And so this is different from before because before we were just waiting for a quorum of responses, but now the leader you know, has to wait this um, additional delta in order to guarantee all of the honest replicas will be included. With this view change though, uh, we're waiting delta to hear from all the honest replicas. Therefore, if the leader tries to send you know, an old QC with a lower view, then we can sort of detect that the leader is malicious and sort of reject this proposal. So in other words, the replicas can actually catch the leader if it tries um, you know, send it, sending a lower QC. So this view change, unfortunately, lacks optimistic responsiveness since the leader has to wait you know, this delta bound and it does therefore does not progress at the speed of the actual network latency. And so finally, we have the hot stuff view change. And so here, each replica sends the QC, which it has, uh, that it thinks could be committed to the new leader. And so like PBFT, we're actually only waiting for a quorum of responses from replicas. We're not you know, waiting this additional delta. Uh, but sort of as in the Casper and Tendermint case, you know, replicas, you know, catch uh, a potentially lying leader by rejecting a QC if it's for a different value in the lower view. Um, but because the leader actually does not wait delta, it's not guaranteed to hear from other honest replicas. And so a replica will be able to catch a malicious leader. However, sometimes it'll be too conservative and actually reject a proposal thinking the leader was malicious when in fact it was not. And so it was. It could just be the case that it didn't receive, you know, all the QCs from the honest replicas. So this is great. You know, hot stuff achieves optimistic responsiveness and linearity. But are we done now? Well, unfortunately, uh, for you and luckily for me, the answer is no. So the problem with the hot stuff view change is that we actually have to add an additional phase in order for the protocol to be live. And the reason for this is, you know, because of these potential false positives when guarding against malicious leaders. So can we actually do better? Well, hot stuff came ever so close, but the false positives meant that an extra phase was necessary. Let's take a step back and sort of summarize you know, the background. So we pretty much have two main approaches to work with. So the first approach is that all QCs are sent, which allows for a latency of two phases, but this incurs you know, quadratic cost. And sort of the other approach is that we sort of send you know, just the highest QC, but you know, this uh, requires three phases, uh, but it's linear. So the key question we ask is whether we can actually, you know, figure out a way to encode all the QCs in such a way that we only use one, one authenticator, thereby, you know, getting linearity. And sort of this is precisely the question that the no commit proof uh, answers. So now I'm going to sort of uh, show this no commit proof construct, which is sort of able to summarize the information from a PBFT style view change just using one authenticator. And this information allows a replica to know whether the leader was being malicious when saying its proposal. And they're called no commit proofs because it's sort of a proof that a replica's QC uh, could not have been committed. And um, to do this, we're gonna sort of rely on two main observations. So our first observation here is that because the prepare phase guards against equivocation, we actually really don't care about a particular value of QC, you know, in this case, U uh, or V or W. Since there can be at most you know, one QC that forms in a given view, the view number itself uniquely identifies the QC. And so for instance, you know, there can't be you know, QCs for both uh, U and U prime to form in view one. So now we can just focus on the view of the QC rather than the particular value. And sort of our second observation is that replicas are sending view change message to begin a new view. And then this new view that they're going to enter is gonna be common among them. So in this case, in this example, we have you know, view changes all for uh, you know, going to view five. So before I show you the actual no commit proof construction, I'm going to show some straw man approaches. Um, so let's look at sort of a, a naive way to try to uh, construct these no commit proofs. So here in this example, um, we're going to denote each QC using a different color for clarity. And so for this straw man, we're going to assign each QC view number, getting you know sigma one, sigma two through sigma four, and we're going to try to aggregate these signatures into one signature. And so the question here is whether you know, we can actually aggregate you know, sigma one through sigma four into one signature easily, maybe using something like an aggregator. So you're probably thinking, um, you know, let's use multi-signatures or better yet, aggregate signatures. There are unfortunately some obstacles we run into. See, multi-signatures require the same message to be signed, which we don't have in this case. And aggregate signatures work, but they're expensive uh, since they require a linear number of pairings uh, for verification. So can we actually do better? The answer is yes. 
And to do so, we're going to try to simulate the functionality of an aggregate signature scheme, which works on signatures for different messages, but use multi signatures under the hood for increased efficiency. So let's kind of see how we're going to do this with uh, straw man two. So now I'm going to show you the straw man of how to get around, you know, having this problem having signatures on distinct messages. And so namely, each replica is going to generate a secret key for every possible view number the QC could have. And, you know, we're going to use observation two to our advantage. Namely, we will sign the common view we are entering. So in this case, five, using the corresponding secret key we generated for, before. So we have here that to encode a QC for view one example, we'll use the blue secret key. For QC for view two, we'll use the green secret key and so on and so forth. And so because we're signing the same message, you know, this common view five, we can actually use BLS multi-signature aggregation. And so this results into results in a single signature sigma that's an aggregation of all these signatures. And so we are still able to encode the view number of the QC through the particular usage uh, of the secret key. So this is all good, right? Like, you know, what's the issue? Well, the problem here is that the QC view numbers can be like indefinitely large. And so we cannot generate, you know, these keys on the fly because we assume there's some sort of bootstrapping setup phase at the beginning in which public keys are exchanged and verified. And so the scheme is not practical because we need to generate and exchange an infinite number of keys in the setup phase. So now let's kind of get through to the no commit uh, proof construction. So we're gonna show how to bound the number of keys we generate. And so the idea here is that instead of encoding the view of the QC itself, we're, gonna, we're going to encode the difference between V, the common view that the replicas are entering and VI, the, v, the view of the QC itself. So for example, suppose the replicas are entering view 2000. So we're gonna have V equals 2000. We're gonna try to encode a QC with view 1999. So VI equals 1999. And we're going to take the difference. And so this blue key is going to encode the difference, which is one. But if we were to use the straw man from before, we'd have had to encode 1999, which would require generating like and exchanging a whole bunch of more of public keys at the beginning. So kind of reverting back to our initial example, using the view difference encoding results in, sort of in the following differences, uh, four, three, two, and one respectively. And so that's kind of like sort of the crux of the no commit proof construction. There are going to be more details in the paper, such as how we can further optimize um, the number of keys we have to generate, generate by converting, you know, the difference to binary, how we guard against, you know, stale QCs and, you know, additional security proofs. And so now I'm going to briefly talk about Wendy, our new consensus protocol. So using these no commit proofs, we actually construct a new BFT protocol called Wendy, which achieves all of these three magic properties. And so the cool thing about these no commit proofs is that they're kind of only needed when we have sort of uh, the false positive situation we talked about earlier. And again, we can find more details in the paper. So now I'm gonna briefly talk about the evaluation. So we compare our no commit proof scheme uh, with the state of the art aggregate signature scheme, BGLS, which can combine signatures on different messages. And so from, you know, our graph you know, here, we show that our scheme performs much better because the verification time, um, you know, because we're using multi-signatures under the hood on the same message, it takes only two pairings, which, you know, is typically the bottleneck here. And so for higher values of the F, this difference in, you know, constant versus linear pairings is much more pronounced. And so I wasn't lying here when I'm telling you that, you know, these aggregate signature schemes are very costly. And so, you know, for F equals 64, you can see our scheme takes three milliseconds versus 127. And sort of a brief uh, discussion about, you know, our Wendy protocol, here's a latency throughput graph in the white area that shows, you know, by leveraging, you know, these no commit proofs, we can actually achieve uh, about 33% lower latency with you know, uh, comparable throughput. And again, more details are in the paper. This is in a wide area setting with, you know, batch size of 400 as, you know, as sort of a quick example here. And so to wrap up, I just want to uh, sort of conclude that we came up with this no commit no commit proof construct, which summarizes the information in a PBFT view change using just one authenticator. The scheme is much cheaper than the BGLS aggregate signature scheme we compare against since we leverage multi-signatures. And we then use this, you know, sort of gadget to construct a new BFT consensus protocol that's very similar to hot stuff that achieves, you know, the sort of three major properties that we care about. And yeah, you can, uh, you know, check out the paper for more details um, using this QR code.